the same page when we're talking about something. So I'm curious what you all think when I say the word habitat. Um, let's see, we've got a couple of answers rolling in. Um, somebody says a home for animals. That's a great answer. Um, that's from a seven-year-old. Uh, animal home. Somebody else says a place to live. That's totally a great answer too. Somebody else says environment you live in, a specific environment, climate. Yeah, so these are all great answers. So a habitat, usually how we describe a habitat at the museum is that a habitat is a place where plants and animals live. It's a home for animals and plants. So that's a great place to get started. But just like anything in science, uh, the deeper you get, the more complex and the more interesting that it gets. So I actually see a couple of answers that are saying exactly what I'm gonna talk about. That habitat is totally a place where plants and animals can live, but it's made up of a lot of different stuff. So not only is it made up of the plants and animals that live in the habitat, like this beautiful rainforest behind me, but it's also made up of a lot of non-living things. So some people have mentioned that it's the right environment, it's the right climate. And so living things are a huge part of a habitat, but non-living things are also a huge part of a habitat. So things like soil and rocks, um, but not only those, also things like temperature and the amount of rainfall that a place gets all affect what a habitat is. So that's great. So we have kind of a definition of what a habitat is then, right? It's a place where plants and animals live and we know kind of what makes a habitat. Um, habitats are super, super cool. Um, and I'm excited to talk a little bit more about the specific habitats here in the museum. So habitats, um, the habitats that we have here in the museum are actually representative of North American habitats. I know we have a lot of people that aren't from North America here. So uh, you might be familiar with some of these or some of these might be totally new to you, which is really cool. Usually when people come into the museum, this is the habitats that they're kind of used to seeing. Um, but our habitats represent different habitats through North America. And they start at the bottom of North America and work their way up. So we're at the very tip of the bottom of North America right now down in kind of the Central American uh, Mexican area, um, looking at a rainforest. And a rainforest is a really, really cool habitat. Um, talking about what we said with habitats, that habitats are made up of living things and non-living things. Um, rainforests are full of all sorts of diverse plants and animals, but also um, are affected by their temperature and the amount of rainfall that they get. So rainforests, like their name, get a bunch of rain, um, as you might guess. And rainforests are also usually pretty warm. Um, so I'm gonna move the camera a little bit closer so you guys can see some of the details in this rainforest habitat. Um, actually, I might flip the camera around so I can kind of control it a little bit better and everybody's able to see it. Um, let's see. There we go. Switch my camera so everyone can see. So this is our rainforest diorama here at the museum. Um, you'll notice a couple of things probably right off the bat. There's one guy down in the bottom corner here um, that I'm pointing at. And that is a really, really cool animal that I like to talk about when we look at this habitat. Um, does anybody have any idea what animal this is? Um, I'm curious if we have some people who aren't from the United States that they might've even seen this animal before, um, but it's, it's a pretty interesting animal. And so let's see, we can wait a couple minutes. Um, or even if you don't know, yeah, what uh, the exact animal is, if you know what type of animal it is. And we've got a couple of really good answers coming in. Everybody's saying, yeah, it's a deer. It's some kind of deer, right? Oh, somebody said a taper. That's a really good guess. It's about the size of a taper, but it's, it's, uh, it's not quite a taper. Um, so yeah, so this is a deer. And so I'm curious, looking at this deer, do you guys think that this is an adult deer? Or do you think that this is a baby deer? Just based off of the size compared to how it's, uh, compared to uh, all the other stuff in the, the habitat around it. We've got a couple answers coming in. It looks like it's about half and half so far. Some people think it's an adult, some people think it's a baby. This is actually an adult deer. So this is something that's called a mazama or a brocket deer. Um, it, it's actually fully grown right there. Um, it's about the size of a small dog. Uh, if it were standing right next to me, it would come up a little bit above my knee. Um, so you can see this deer right here. That is a tiny, tiny deer. And one of the really cool things about this exhibit and this uh, habitat hall is that every single habitat actually features different types of deer and how they're adapted to different habitats throughout North America. So as we go through the habitats, you guys are gonna be able to see all of these different deer um, and really kind of get a great idea about uh, how deer have adapted to all these different areas. So deer is really, really cool in the uh, rainforest diorama. It's something you guys might have not seen before. Oh yeah, so somebody said that it looks like something that they've seen before called, um, uh, I think they said a duke here, um, which is another type of small deer. Um, and so yeah, they're, they're probably closely related to that. 
which is awesome. Um, but one thing I want to talk about before we move on to look at some of the other habitats uh, is what a habitat diorama actually is. So we've looked at this diorama behind me a little bit. We've seen uh, some of the details of it. You guys saw the deer in the habitat diorama. Um, but something that a lot of people don't think about when they go to a museum is that habitat dioramas are made by people. Um, and that seems like kind of an obvious thing, right? Everything in the museum is made by people. But if you don't think about that, you might look at this habitat diorama and say, oh man, it looks like they just took a slice of rainforest, and picked it up and put it in the museum. Um, and so something really, really cool to think about when you're at a museum is that all of the objects that are in this diorama are actually handmade by artists, by other people at the museum. Um, so even though this looks like a tree right next to me here, this tree is actually made out of things like plaster and wood. Um, so it looks like a real tree, but it's actually fake. Um, same thing with a lot of the leaves. They look like real leaves, but they're actually made out of things like paper and wax. Um, and this makes sense when you think about it, right? That we don't want to just put a whole tree or a bunch of leaves in this diorama because over time they would break down. So we want to make materials in the museum that are going to last for a really long time. Um, these habitat dioramas were built in the 1960s, so that's about 80 years ago now. Um, and so these have been, uh, is that 80 years? No, no, that's 60 years. I did my math backwards. Um, it's about uh, 60 years ago. Um, but so these habitat dioramas have had to hold up to the test of time, right? If we were to use things like real leaves or real trees, they might break down. So everything in here is a recreation of an actual habitat on earth somewhere. Um, so usually when people in museums are making a habitat, they will go to that place, take pictures, and then recreate it in the museum for everybody to see, which is super awesome. And it means that we get to see all sorts of cool stuff from all over the world right here in our own backyard. So this is the rainforest diorama we've looked at. There's all sorts of cool stuff here that um, I'm gonna save maybe for a little bit later, but we can move on and look at our next diorama. Um, let's see, it looks like somebody raised their hand there. I'm not sure if that was on purpose, but if you do have a question, you can leave it in the chat box or you can leave it in the Q&A. I'll be happy to answer it for you. All right. And so we have another habitat diorama right here behind us that I've moved, uh, moved over to. Let's see. I see some people are, uh, are raising their hands. So I just wanted to double check, make sure nobody had left anything. Oh, that's all good. Somebody says they, they hit the button by accident. Yeah, if you do have a question, like I said, you can totally leave that in the chat box or in the Q&A. That'll be great. Yeah, so we moved on to our next habitat. And so we moved a little bit further north in North America. Um, in the rainforest diorama, we were all the way down at the bottom um, in the sort of Central American, uh, Southern Mexico area. And now we've moved a little bit further north to Northern Mexico and areas like Southern California and Nevada. Um, and this is a habitat that you guys probably recognize. Um, do you wanna put in the chat what, dior or what uh, habitat this is? This is probably something you guys all can guess either if you've been there before or if you're just uh, just familiar with it. But it's definitely something you guys have seen before. Let's see, somebody says that they, they see a deer. Yeah, that's totally right. It looks like a desert. Yes, that is exactly right. So this is our desert diorama. Um, deserts are, like we talked about, areas that are a little bit north, um, at least in North America, a little bit north of the rainforest we were talking about before. Um, and deserts are just like the rainforest. Uh, they're affected by their temperature and their amount of rainfall. So deserts are warm, rainforests are usually warm, but the big difference is the amount of rain that they get. Rainforests get a whole bunch of rain, deserts don't usually get very much. So the desert environment is completely different than the rainforest because they get a different amount of rainfall. Um, somebody had a great question. Somebody says, what's this tree right here behind me? Um, this is actually something that's called a Spanish bayonet. I don't know a lot about it, unfortunately. Um, I'm not from the desert and I have not been to the desert, so I can't answer a lot of questions about the plants. Um, I can answer some great questions about the animals though. Um, so if anybody has questions about anything they see, I'm happy to answer it though. Um, but yeah, it's, it's called a Spanish bayonet. But somebody else mentioned that they did see the deer right behind me here. And so I can scooch over a little bit. Um, and this is a deer that might look a little familiar to you um, if you're from Michigan or you're from some other areas. Um, it looks a lot like a deer that we have in Michigan called a white-tailed deer, which we might actually look at a little bit later, spoiler alert. Um, but this is a different species of deer that's called a mule deer. Mule deer are super cool. Um, they're uh, kind of closely related to white-tailed deer and serve kind of a similar purpose in the environment. Um, but these are desert deer, so they're able to go for a longer time without water, um, and they're just, just some really, really cool animals. 
Um, something interesting that we can talk about as well when we're in this desert diorama is the fact that these dioramas, like we said, are made by people, um, which means that they aren't perfect recreations of nature, right? So if we were to go out to the desert, do you guys think that it would look exactly like this? It'd be all beautiful and lush and full of all sorts of animals and plants just right here in like a 15 square, uh, 15 square foot space. Uh, the answer is probably not, right? So deserts aren't completely dead. Um, you know, people will think that, oh, you know, a desert is just an area that's full of sand and sand dunes. Um, and that's not always true, right? Deserts have plants, deserts have animals, but they aren't always this concentrated together. So when people are making a habitat diorama, like we have in Habitat Hall, they're going to try and create what we would call kind of like a perfect slice of nature. So rather than being totally accurate and maybe just having one deer and a bush, um, they're going to try and show the diversity of life that's in each habitat. So it's important to remember that when you're looking at habitat dioramas. If you see something like a watering hole diorama at a museum and there's all of these animals all gathered around together, um, that might be true sometimes in nature, but nature usually isn't that diverse and crazy, um, just concentrated in one spot. So that's something to kind of keep in mind as we're walking through today. But yeah, desert diorama, super cool, one of my favorites. Um, and now I said something earlier in the, in the program. I said that every habitat that we're going to look at actually has a different type of deer. And it shows you how deer have adapted to different environments in North America, which is super cool. Um, but I actually lied a little bit. That's not totally true. And this diorama actually changes that answer. That, this diorama is the reason that that's not true. Um, if you guys look at the animals in this diorama behind me, what would you call this animal? What do you think this animal might be called? We've got a couple answers rolling in. Let's see. Let's see what else other people have to say. We've got a couple of answers. We've got, oh, all sorts of different stuff. Yeah, so uh, people, uh, if, you, if you're familiar with this animal, it's a really weird animal to look at, right? And so some people have some different answers about what they think it might be. Somebody says it looks like a grassland deer. A lot of people say deer. Somebody said elk. Um, a lot of people are saying antelope. Somebody says a goat. Um, and a couple people had the right answer. They're saying the word pronghorn. And that's what this is. This is what's called a pronghorn antelope. Um, I'm gonna scooch over a little bit so everyone is able to see the pronghorn antelope. Um, this is called a pronghorn antelope. And you would be forgiven for thinking that this is a deer, right? They look very, very similar to deer, but they're actually not. Um, and so to talk about what a pronghorn is, we have to talk about what it isn't. So I've got a couple specimens below me. I'm gonna duck down for a second and pick them up. We love using hands-on objects at the museum. Um, so I have an object in my hands right here. Um, do you guys wanna leave in the chat? Do you know what object this is? Do you know what this is from? Let's see, we've got a couple people answering. And if you're from Michigan, especially, you definitely recognize this object, it's everywhere. Um, so yeah, so a lot of people are saying the right answer. This is a deer antler. This is a white-tailed deer antler. Oh, somebody said a stick. It looks kind of like a stick, right? Um, but this is a white-tailed deer antler. And this is an antler that we'd see all the time on the deer that are found in Michigan. Um, antlers are really cool. Antlers are made out of bone. And obviously, just like any antler, they grow out of the animal's head. Um, but something kind of crazy about antlers that you might not know is that deer actually lose their antlers every year. So anytime you see a deer with antlers, especially if you see like a big buck with huge antlers, they actually lost those antlers last year and then regrew them over the course of just one year. So this whole bone within just one year, which is crazy. Um, and they're just made out of solid bone. Uh, so they're, they're pretty, pretty cool. So that's what an antler is. Deer always have antlers. But there's another type of growth that you can have on your head if you're an animal, and that's a horn. So some animals, instead of having those bony antlers, will actually have horns. And so I'll show you guys this horn right here. I believe this is a horn from a cow. Um, so animals like cows and goats and sheep and even some African antelopes, a lot of African antelopes will have horns as well. And so the difference between a horn and an antler is what's on the inside. An antler is made just out of bone, but a horn has bone on the inside and that's called a bony core. But then it has this structure on the outside. And this structure is called a keratin sheath. Um, and so keratin is, if you guys uh, aren't familiar, it's the same stuff that your nails and your hair are made out of. So all the animals with horns, things like goats and sheep and cows, all have a bony core and then a keratin sheath on the outside that protects that horn. 
And it's important to remember that horns are not lost every year. So an animal that has a horn is going to keep that horn for its entire life. Uh, it's just gonna keep growing and growing and growing. So they're animals with antlers that have these bony antlers that they lose every year. They're animals with horns that have a bony core with a keratin sheath that they don't lose every year. And then we have our friends, the pronghorns. And so pronghorns are really weird because they have a horn, they have a bony core on the inside and a keratin sheath on the outside, but they lose that horn every year. And they're the only animal that does that, which is super, super weird. And it's something that we don't see anywhere else. And so we know the pronghorn can't be deer because they don't have antlers. And they can't really be an antelope or an African antelope at least because they lose their horns. So pronghorns, we actually know, are leftovers from the ice age. So they're their entire new group of animals, or not new group of animals, but they're their own group of animals that's called Antilla Capridae. Um, and they're leftovers from the ice age. They used to have a lot of different relatives that would bounce around uh, the North America and all the rest of them went extinct, except for our friends, the pronghorns. So pronghorns are really, really cool animals. Um, and we're lucky that they're still around. There's one other cool thing in this diorama that I wanna show you guys. I'm gonna have to flip you around and get you a little close so everyone's able to see it. Um, but when we were talking about the fact that dioramas are made by people, um, I told you that dioramas weren't a perfect version of nature, right? They're, they're, they're trying to be a perfect version of nature. Um, so the dioramas are kind of weird when people make them. Um, they try and create this idea of nature that doesn't really exist, right? So these animals are perfectly placed. You can see that the, the males and the females are, are looking at each other and you know the, the babies are looking out toward the, the person that's looking at the diorama and everything is just kind of, kind of perfect. Um, but in reality, this isn't how nature is, right? Um, we've known for a very long time that humans have a lot of impacts on different environments um, and humans have a huge impact on the earth. So trying to create this perfect slice of nature wouldn't really be complete unless we included some human impacts on it. Um, so I'm gonna turn the camera around so I can show you guys the human impacts that are in this diorama. Um, and this diorama was first created, I think I said in the 1960s, and some of these things were added in the 1980s uh, to show the human impacts on the earth. So I'm gonna try and see, I'm not sure if I can zoom in or not. I don't think I can. Um, but way off in the distance, way in the corner, right above the baby pronghorn, you might be able to see, I'm going to try and point this out, a little trail of dust that's coming up right here. And this little trail of dust and the tracks that are coming behind it are coming from a car. And that car or other, other vehicle with a motor is driving across the prairie which is really bad for prairie habitats. Um, this is, somebody actually just asked what diorama this was. This is our grassland diorama. So this is an area that would be kind of out in the Midwest, out to like areas like Montana and um, up through that kind of area. Um, areas like Oklahoma and stuff too, kind of in the middle of, the, of North America. Um, but so some of these dioramas do have these little indications of human impacts on the earth. Um, and they're kind of interesting Easter eggs. So when the museum does reopen back to the public, if you guys are able to get here, definitely keep an eye on the back of the dioramas to see all of those cool things that have been added to our habitats. So this was our grassland diorama and we're actually gonna show off just one more um, and look at one more habitat that you guys are probably familiar with if you're from Michigan. Um, of course, a lot of you aren't from Michigan, so it might be new for some of you, which will be pretty fun. Um, so we'll go over and check out that last habitat. And then there's a whole group of animals in this room that you might've seen a couple of times when I flipped the camera around. Um, so we'll, we'll check those out right after that. Um, those are kind of the, the big showstoppers. So I wanna save those for last. Um, let's see, I'm going to pull up my chat here again so I can see everybody talking. That's awesome. All right. Oh, and we've got a request to see if I can uh, show something else off. Yeah, totally. If we have time, I will definitely do that, uh, Ellie. That's, that should be awesome. All right. So this is the last habitat that we're going to check out right here. Um, and if you guys are from Michigan or if you've been to the museum before, this is probably a habitat that you recognize. Um, does someone want to let me know what, uh, what type of habitat they think this might be? We've got a couple of answers about different animals that they see. Um, if you guys are from Michigan, yeah, we see, uh, we see somebody has an answer right there. They say, uh, uh, we'll wait a couple minutes so I don't, uh, I don't give it, spoil it away. But yeah, everybody's got the right answer so far. This is a type of forest. Um, and this is a forest that's called an Eastern deciduous forest. 
Um, and all of that means is that it's in the east of something. In this case, it's in the east of North America, the eastern part of North America. And the word deciduous uh, refers to the type of trees that are there. So deciduous trees are trees with tall, broad leaves, um, and they lose those leaves in the winter. So if we're really used to that in Michigan, the idea that trees lose their leaves in the fall, in the winter they're barren, and then in the spring they grow norm, they grow more leaves. Um, so this is an eastern deciduous forest, like you could see walking through Michigan. Um, I see somebody says, is it in the redwoods? Um, I'm not actually familiar with the redwoods. I believe redwoods are some sort of, uh, some sort of conifer, some sort of, uh, some sort of like not quite a pine tree, but related to pine trees. Um, I'm not totally sure though, so don't take my word on that. I'm from Michigan, not California. So um, yeah, but this is, these are deciduous trees. Um, so this habitat is one of my favorites. It's always a favorite when people come to the museum. I'm gonna move the chat away so I can see what I'm looking at. Um, and so you can see there's all sorts of cool stuff. Um, a couple people mentioned the animals that we see in the background. These are the ones that I've been talking about at a couple of the different habitats. These are our white-tailed deer. Um, I'll move a little bit closer so everyone's able to see them. Um, we've got three deer here in this habitat. We have a big one and two babies. Um, the big one is the mother deer, of course, and then the two babies are her fawns. Um, you might not be able to see on screen, but I can see right here in front of me. Um, you can tell that they're fawns and not just small deer, like our brocket deer or mazama, um, because they have spots on the back. And somebody actually said that in the comments earlier, that they knew that that brocket deer was an adult because it didn't have spots on the back. Um, so that's a really great indication of knowing when a deer is, uh, when a deer is an adult. Yeah, somebody said like Bambi, and so that's exactly right. Um, and these white-tailed deer actually have spots on their back for a really cool reason, and that reason is camouflage. Um, so in these deciduous forests, there's all of these leaves up top, and when light comes through the deciduous forest, um, the sunlight gets kind of scattered, and we call it dappled, um, and it'll just kind of fall on some of the leaves on the ground um, and just make a bunch of kind of bright spots all over the place. And so if you're a deer and you're a baby deer and you're not really able to protect yourself, um, you want to blend in with your environment so nothing comes to bother you. So these baby deer uh, are brown with white spots on them so they can blend in with the dappled forest floor with the sunlight coming down from the top. Um, I actually have something here, another specimen I'll pull up. And this is a white-tailed deer skull. Um, white-tailed deer are super cool. They're really common in Michigan. So people kind of uh, don't give them a second glance. They just think about them when they're driving, making sure that they don't hit them. Um, but white-tailed deer are really, really interesting, cool animals. Um, and one of my favorite things about them is actually if we look at their teeth underneath here. Uh, I don't know if you've ever looked at deer teeth too closely before. Make sure we can actually see it on the camera. But deer teeth are something that's called lunate, which refers to the shape that they are. Um, so if you look at all of the little bits of teeth here, you can see that they form kind of a bunch of crescent moons. Um, and the reason for this, that's where the name lunate comes from, is because they're shaped like a moon. Um, but the reason for this is because of what deer eat. So animals have all sorts of different shaped teeth if they're eating different things. We know that animals that eat meat are gonna have sharp teeth. Animals that eat plants are gonna have sort of like flatter, rougher teeth that they're able to use for grinding. Um, and deer eat all sorts of different stuff. They eat grass, they eat lots of different shrubs and plants. And so they use these lunate teeth to sort of break down all the stuff that they're eating before they swallow it. So deer teeth, super, super cool. Um, this is a female deer as well. You can tell because she doesn't have any antlers on her. But deer are not the only animals in this habitat. And I'm curious, I think it might be a little bit too dark, but I'm gonna try and zoom in on one more uh, animal in this habitat. Let's see. Switch my camera around and then I'll get down right close. Oh, you guys might be able to see that. So there's an animal that is blending into the ground. It's a little bit out of focus. So I'm gonna try and point it out for everyone. Um, yeah, you can't really see that on the camera, but the animal is right here next to the mushrooms and right below the baby deer. Um, does anybody have any idea what this animal is? And if you don't, that's totally okay. Like I said, it's a little bit hard to see it, um, but I'm curious if you guys can maybe see it a little bit better than I'm seeing it on my camera. 
um, but it's a small animal. It's about the size of a small rock. Oh, somebody says a leaf bug. That's a good guess. There would definitely be leaf bugs in this environment. Um, somebody else said rattlesnake, also a good guess, but rattlesnakes are gonna be found, I guess they could be found in this environment. Um, if this is, a, this is what we call a mid-Michigan forest, um, and rattlesnakes are usually found a little bit further north in Michigan. Um, we have a rattlesnake called the Massasauga rattler, um, but it is a reptile. Oh, and somebody just had the exact right answer. Uh, points go to Karen. Um, this is a turtle. This is a, a, a turtle right here in the, where am I pointing at it? Right there. This is what's called a box turtle. And box turtles are super cool. And even if you live in Michigan, it might not be an animal that you have seen before. Um, so I'm gonna turn myself back around and I'm gonna show you guys a box turtle because box turtles are super cool and they're really fun. So in my bag of tricks below me, I have a box turtle shell. And so box turtles are really, really interesting. Um, most turtles that we're, we would see, we're used to the idea that turtles like to live in water and on land, right? So you wouldn't be surprised if you saw a turtle climb into a pond. But box turtles are actually, they act a lot more like tortoises. And tortoises do not like the water. Tortoises are what we call terrestrial. They walk around only on land. Um, so box turtles, are a lot more like tortoises. They are a type of turtle. They're closely related to turtles, but they don't like the water very much. Um, and the reason that they're called box turtles, you can see when I turn it around, is because of their shell. So box turtles are able to completely close their shell up like a little box. Um, this one is completely empty. There's no box turtle inside. This is just a box turtle shell. Um, but they're, they're really, really cool that they're able to close this up. And this is a really great adaptation that stops them from being eaten by predators, which is great. Um, and then just for comparison, I have another turtle shell here. This is a turtle shell from a red-eared slider. This is another common Michigan turtle. And so if I turn this a little bit, you can see the red-eared slider, uh, the turtle would sit inside this little empty bit. Um, but the red-eared slider is not able to close its shell like a box. The red-eared slider a shell is just full of turtle. The turtles can tuck their heads and their arms in, but they're not able to fully close the way the box turtle can. So that's pretty neat. So we spent a lot of time talking about a lot of great habitats here at the museum, um, but we're about halfway through the tour. So of course we have to talk about the other half of the gallery. Um, you might've seen it a little bit when I've been turning the camera around, um, but these guys are kind of the showstoppers in the gallery and they are, I'll turn the camera so everyone can see, they are our dinosaurs. Um, people love the dinosaurs here at the Michigan State University Museum. And we're going to talk about all of them, which is awesome. People will all get to talk about their favorite dinosaurs. Um, but before we talk about the big dinosaurs, we actually have a couple of smaller dinosaurs over in the corner of the gallery. So I'm going to take us over there so we can check out those dinosaurs. And these dinosaur bones are super cool. Like I said, everybody loves to talk about the dinosaurs here at the museum. Um, I will turn myself around so I can see you all and the dinosaurs here. Um, something that's important to talk about as well, when we're talking about dinosaur bones in a museum, is that all of these bones in the museum, or at least most of them that are on display in this gallery, are what we call casts. And so when I say the word cast, I mean that it is not an actual fossil made out of rock. It is a copy of a fossil. And that's not true of all the fossils in this room. We actually do have one real fossil in this room, um, but the rest of them are perfect replicas. And there's a lot of good reasons for that, right? So for one thing, we can see the dinosaurs behind me. We have a couple of them that I won't name yet, so I can ask you guys later if you know the names. Um, but you can see that they're mounted skeletons, right? They're mounted the same way that the dinosaur would sit in real life. If they were made out of real bones, it would be a lot harder to do that. We wouldn't be able to drill through the bone. We could, but we couldn't really do it ethically. Um, and so there'd be all sorts of different issues about trying to mount those real bones. Um, if the bones are mounted as well, it means that we can't study them in the museum. Once they're in a display, they're kind of stuck there unless someone wants to take the display all apart. So when we have a whole mounted skeleton like this, it's great if it can be a copy of a dinosaur instead of actual fossilized rock. And the other thing about casts in a museum is that even though we find a lot of dinosaur fossils, we don't find so many that every museum could have a complete dinosaur, right? So we have a couple of these huge dinosaurs behind us. Um, it would be impossible for every museum that wants to have a dinosaur to have a full dinosaur on display, just because we don't find that many well-preserved fossils. So museums will have casts, so we can talk all about all the cool dinosaurs and every museum is able to do that that wants to. 
Um, and then the final thing is just that along with the idea that we don't find a lot of great well-preserved dinosaurs, um, sometimes you'll only find some of the bones of a dinosaur. So you might find a skull, you might find a right leg, you might find a hip bone, and you might find you know, a left leg. So that's great. You really only have half a dinosaur at that point. But if you have one arm bone, the great thing about animals is that most of us are mere images of each other. So if you have one arm bone, you can figure out what the other arm bone would look like. So a lot of casts in museums, some of them are complete dinosaurs, things like Sue the T-Rex, the Field Museum, is a complete dinosaur skeleton. They just found, or not almost complete dinosaur skeleton. They found a lot of Sue. Um, but other museums, casts might only have parts of a real dinosaur, and then the other half is just a mere image of that first fossil. Um, so lots of cool stuff talking about dinosaurs in museums. But we have some cool dinosaurs behind me here, so we can start talking about them. Um, I'm just going to talk about the, the two over here. Um, the other two dinosaurs are also awesome, but we just don't quite have time for them. Um, so I'm going to start out talking about this dinosaur here. Um, and I'm curious if you guys in the chat can let me know, um, what do you think that this dinosaur ate? Do you think that this dinosaur ate meat? Do you guys think this dinosaur ate plants? Do you guys think that this dinosaur ate cheeseburgers? Do you guys think that this dinosaur ate bananas? Um, what do you think that this dinosaur ate? Yeah, so we're getting all sorts of good answers. Um, we're seeing that a lot of people said uh, meat, 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 definitely meat, 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 meat. Yes, this dinosaur ate meat. Um, and there's a really easy way to tell, right? Everybody kind of has that ingrained in their brain. And the reason is because of these sharp teeth that it has right here. Oh, if I'm pointing at the right dinosaur, there we go. Yeah, it's got all these sharp teeth and somebody else just let me know that this dinosaur is a carnivore. And that is exactly right. Um, so carnivorous animals and carnivorous dinosaurs eat meat. Um, this dinosaur is called Deinonychus, and Deinonychus is super, super cool. He's one of my favorite dinosaurs. And the reason for that isn't because of what Deinonychus did when it was alive, but it's actually about Deinonychus's history. So before dinosaurs, or before dinosaurs, before paleontologists discovered Deinonychus, um, a lot of paleontologists thought that dinosaurs were kind of slow and sluggish and that they wouldn't move around very much. Um, they figured that dinosaurs might live even in swamps, um, and that they were just kind of these slow, sluggish animals. And that makes sense to an extent, right? We know that dinosaurs are reptiles. So same thing as our turtles or as the snakes we were talking about earlier. Um, and reptiles are usually cold-blooded, which means that, um, or at least that's the, the term that some people use is cold-blooded. Um, but cold-blooded just means that the animal doesn't make heat for itself. It needs to absorb heat from something else. Um, so a snake or a turtle or a lizard might lay out on a rock in the sun in order to absorb a bunch of energy, absorb a bunch of heat, and then it's able to move around and eat and do everything that a lizard needs to do before it cools off again at night. Um, so it's understandable that paleontologists thought that dinosaurs might have done that same thing. They're reptiles. They might just be cold-blooded and need to absorb a lot of heat. But when Deinonychus was discovered, paleontologists realized that this was a really fast and agile predator. Um, they found Deinonychus' skeleton and they saw that it had these sharp teeth, it had some really big claws, um, and it was a pretty big dinosaur too. So this is about life size for the Deinonychus skull. It's about the same size as my head. Um, and if you guys are picturing it, it's pretty similar in size to the raptors from Jurassic Park and Jurassic World. Um, Deinonychus is actually one of the inspirations for that, that in Utah Raptor. Um, so Deinonychus, they know, was super big, super agile, um, and so when they discovered this, they realized there's no way dinosaurs can be cold-blooded. Um, they must have been all sorts of really cool, warm-blooded, agile predators and um, plant eaters and just all sorts of stuff. So it uh, started something called the dinosaur renaissance, and it meant that paleontologists were thinking very differently about dinosaurs and about what we know about dinosaurs. So that's one of my favorite things about Deinonychus is that Deinonychus really flipped paleontology on its head and really changed the way that we think about stuff. And then we have one other dinosaur right next to me. I'll actually leave the camera probably where it is so you guys can see it. And this is this a dinosaur. Um, and so you guys probably have the same idea as we did with Deinonychus. Um, can you tell what this dinosaur eats? Whether this dinosaur eats plants or it eats meat? Um, and I assume you guys will be able to figure out pretty quickly. Again, everybody in the chat saying meat, meat, meat. And that is exactly right, because again, it has those sharp teeth. Um, but there's something really weird about this dinosaur. Um, for one thing, it's a little bit small. This is uh, what we call half scale. So the actual skull will be a little bit bigger. Um, but this dinosaur is from a place that you would never expect dinosaurs to be from. Um, this dinosaur is named Cryolophosaurus. 
Yes, someone has the exact right answer in the chat. Somebody just said what the dinosaur's name was. Yeah, and so it means Cryolophosaurus. All right, so it says Cryolophosaurus. Um, and Cryolophosaurus, if you know anything about language, kind of tells you a little bit about it. So Cryolophosaurus means cold crested lizard. Um, the crested bit is easy to understand, right? It has this huge crest right here on top of its head. So crested makes total sense. But we just said that dinosaurs aren't cold blooded, right? Or most of them weren't, at least we think. Um, so why would this dinosaur be called the cold crested lizard? And the reason for it is because where this dinosaur was found, it was found in a very cold place. Um, so this dinosaur, not this one because it's a cast, but the, the type of dinosaur, Cryolophosaurus, was found near the South Pole in Antarctica. So usually people think of paleontologists digging up fossils in the desert, but paleontology really happens everywhere. Um, so paleontologists studied the history of the earth and they realized that Antarctica hasn't always been cold and down at the bottom of the earth. At some points in its history, Antarctica has actually been further north and a lot warmer. It used to be covered in all sorts of trees and grass and it wasn't a super warm place to live. It was at some points, but at this point it wasn't like tropical, but it was warm enough for dinosaurs to live. And so paleontologists figured, hey, if it was warm enough for dinosaurs to live, maybe they did live there. Um, and it turns out that they totally did live in Antarctica um, before it was cold, which is super cool. Um, so the reason Cryolophosaurus is called Cryolophosaurus is because it lived in a place that's cold. Um, so it's super cool. We have Antarctic dinosaurs, which is awesome. Um, so those are some of our small skulls, but we do have a couple of big boys back here too that we will talk about as well. Um, so I'm going to move the camera a little bit so we can see our first dinosaur. But I'm curious if you guys in the chat are able to leave me an answer about what this first dinosaur is that I'm looking at right here. And this one should be a little bit of a gimme. I'm sure you guys have seen this dinosaur before. It's the one with all of the crests on its back, all of the plates on its back. Um, and I'm gonna move my camera a little bit more. Just wanna make sure I wasn't gonna give the answer away on the signage. All right, and everybody's getting the right answer. This dinosaur is a Stegosaurus. Um, I can't even fit the whole thing into the camera. I'll get as much as I can. All right, so this dinosaur is a Stegosaurus. Stegosaurus is super cool. It's one of my favorite dinosaurs. Um, and when we were talking about Cryolophosaurus, about how it got its name, Stegosaurus actually has a really cool history of its name too. Um, so Stegosaurus actually means roof lizard or, um, or like roof plated lizard. Um, and the reason for that is because when scientists first found Stegosaurus, they didn't know what the plates were supposed to be doing. Nowadays, we look at a Stegosaurus, it's pretty obvious that the little plates go all the way down its back and onto its tail. That's something that we all just kind of understand about Stegosaurus. But when scientists first found Stegosaurus, it was the first time that they'd ever seen plates like this on an animal and they had no idea what the plates were supposed to be for. So somebody had the idea that maybe it's a roof lizard. Maybe all of these plates kind of stack on top of themselves like shingles on a roof. And maybe they're used for protection. Maybe they're sort of like an armor on top of the dinosaur. People didn't really know at that point. Um, we now know that the plates stand up vertically on the back of Stegosaurus. And we're still not really sure what the plates are for though. We have a lot of good guesses, but nobody's 100% sure. Um, some people think that the plates might be used for what we call thermoregulation. Um, and so thermoregulation is like what we've been talking about with warm-blooded and cold-blooded animals, um, that Stegosaurus might use the plates to help warm itself up or cool itself down. Um, so if the plates were covered in skin and then covered in all sorts of blood vessels, um, they might be able to use those blood vessels to let a bunch of heat out or let a bunch of heat into the body. Um, I don't know how popular that theory is. Um, I haven't heard a lot of people say it is. Um, but that's one idea about why Stegosaurus might have all of these plates. Um, another idea that's more popular and probably more likely is just that Stegosaurus evolved these plates to show off, basically. Um, so we see this in a lot of animals in nature. If you see a bird with brightly colored feathers, you see a deer with huge horns. Um, these plates probably serve that same purpose. So Stegosaurus could show off for members of the opposite sex. They could be, uh, they could show themselves off for the ladies and gentlemen. Um, it was also probably used to help Stegosaurus distinguish between species. So it knew what was the Stegosaurus that it was related to, what was the Stegosaurus that it was a little bit different from. Um, so that's probably what the plates were for, is uh, uh, looking at uh, the different types of Stegosaurus and showing off a little bit. There's one other cool bit of Stegosaurus that we haven't looked at yet, and that is the tail. Um, and so you guys can see the Stegosaurus tail over in the back here. And I actually have a piece of Stegosaurus tail that I'm gonna be able to show you guys, um, just so you can kind of get a scale for how big this is. 
So this is my body, obviously, and this is the piece of the Stegosaurus tail right next to me. Um, and so Stegosaurus tails are covered in these spikes. Um, and one of my, my favorite stories about these Stegosaurus spikes is that people didn't actually have a good name for them for a very, very long time until eventually, I believe it was Gary Larson, who is a, um, who is a cartoonist, um, actually gave them a name in one of his comics. Um, he decided to call it a Thagomizer. Um, and then that name just kind of stuck in paleontology. So I don't know if there's any papers that call this a Thagomizer, but a lot of people just informally call this a Thagomizer because it didn't have a name before. Um, but so this is a stegosaurus tail spike. Um, and you can see that as it's a fossil, it's not super pointy, um, but stegosaurus would use these tail spikes that were attached to their tail to kind of wave them around and uh, try and defend itself from predators, which actually include the next dinosaur that we can talk about. So stegosaurus, super, super cool. Um, and we have one question here that says, do the plates keep the dino warm? That's a great question. So when I was talking about um, the, the idea that people might, the dinosaurs might use the plates for thermal regulation, um, that might be true, but it might not. Scientists aren't totally sure. Um, it's just one idea about why these uh, stegosaurus might have these plates. And let's see, I wanna make sure that everybody is able to see the head of this guy because this one's another cool one. Um, does anybody have any ideas what dinosaur this might be? I get out of the way so everyone can see it. So we've got, we've got one that's a skull in the background and then we've got one that's a full skeleton right here. So we're looking at the full skeleton right now, but we are gonna look at the skull in a second. Um, so let's see, we've got a couple of answers coming in. Um, and we've got a lot of people saying some stuff. Let's see, I've only seen one correct answer so far. Um, which is totally okay. Yeah, so a couple of people are getting it right. We're looking at the black dinosaur here. Um, if you said T-Rex, you're very close. T-Rex is the skull that's in the back here. Um, the dinosaur that's in the front is actually a completely different animal. Um, it looks very similar to a T-Rex, right? It's kind of that classic body that we would think of when we think of a T-Rex. It's got those sharp teeth. It's got those tiny claws up front, walks on two legs. And this dinosaur is related to T-Rex. Um, so this is a dinosaur that's called an Allosaurus, and a lot of people are getting that in the comments now, now that they can see that. Um, and Allosaurus is a super cool dinosaur too. So Allosaurus lived at the same time as Stegosaurus. They both lived in the Jurassic period. Um, and Allosaurus was a little bit smaller than T-Rex, but did a lot of the same stuff that T-Rex would do, right? It was a big, huge predator. Um, so it would go after animals like Stegosaurus, for instance, um, and just try to survive as best it could. Um, Allosaurus is a really, really cool dinosaur. Um, we actually have a lot of Allosaurus uh, skeletons and fossils from all different stages of Allosaurus's life, which isn't always true of dinosaurs. So there's some dinosaurs that we don't know what they looked like when they were babies because we haven't found fossils of them yet. But Allosaurus, we have a bunch of great fossils from all the way from it being an egg all the way up to an adult. Um, so we're able to learn all sorts of cool stuff about Allosaurus by studying fossils. Um, and I actually have a quick little thing right below me here. I'm gonna again, turn my camera around so everyone's able to see it. Um, and we like to have this out in the gallery sometimes when we're talking about Allosaurus. And this, these are our Allosaurus foot bones. So again, this is a cast of Allosaurus. This isn't an actual Allosaurus fossil. These are all made out of plaster, um, but you can see some of the huge claws that Allosaurus had. This is uh, about, I don't know, about twice as long as my finger maybe. Um, so Allosaurus had some really, really big claws on its feet um, that it was able to use to, uh, to attack prey if it wanted to. Um, so you can kind of see next to my hand too, just how big Allosaurus's foot was. So it was a very, very large dinosaur, which is awesome. Um, and then we do have one more dinosaur that we're going to check out in the back of the gallery. Um, and that was one that we already talked about, but I will move over so we can see it a little bit better. Flip my camera around so everyone can see me. Let's see, flip, there we go. And so this dinosaur is the T-Rex. T-Rex is one of everybody's favorite dinosaurs. T-Rex is super cool. Um, it's one of my favorite dinosaurs too. And then move this around a little bit so everyone can see T-Rex from the side in all its glory. Um, one interesting thing about T-Rex is actually when it was alive. So we're talking about Allosaurus and Stegosaurus. They were alive in the Jurassic period. Um, Tyrannosaurus was actually around in the late Cretaceous. 
And Tyrannosaurus was around, um, it went extinct about 66 million years ago when the, the big extinction happened for dinosaurs when the, the, the asteroid hit the earth. Um, but the crazy thing about T-Rex is that T-Rex actually lived closer in time to us than it did to Allosaurus and Stegosaurus. So if you ever see a picture of a T-Rex eating a Stegosaurus, you can point at it and say, no, that's wrong um, because they lived in totally different time periods, which is really interesting. Um, and I've got a couple of T-Rex stuff that I'm gonna pull out. And so the first thing is a T-Rex claw. Um, T-Rex was huge. The reason that we only have the skull of a T-Rex and not the rest of the skeleton of a T-Rex is because it was gigantic. I mean, if you've seen Sue at the Field Museum in Chicago, or if you've seen T-Rex at any other museum, you know it's a gigantic animal. Um, so it's really, really hard to, to fit it in a space if there's already dinosaurs in here. Um, so this is T-Rex's claw and you can see, I'll go grab Allosaurus's claw too. Compared between the two of these, you can tell which was the bigger dinosaur, right? This is a T-Rex claw, this is an Allosaurus claw. Um, this is one of the smaller Allosaurus claws, but still. Um, you can see T-Rex had these huge, huge claws um, that it would use on its feet to, uh, to attack prey, but also just you know, for, for walking around and everything you use a claw for. Um, so that's really crazy. T-Rex had absolutely huge claws. But it also had another huge part of its body, and that is its tooth. So this is a T-Rex tooth, it's the same size as all of the ones that are in there. Um, and you can see a little bit easier when it's next to me, the T-Rex tooth is about the same size as my head. Um, so a lot of people like to use a banana for scale for this. And they say that the T-Rex tooth is about the same size as a banana, which is totally true. Um, but T-Rex teeth were huge. They had the largest teeth of any of the two-legged dinosaurs, uh, the two-legged meat-eating theropod dinosaurs um, that ever lived. Um, so T-Rex teeth are super, super cool. Um, this is a cutaway of part of a skull. So you can see that this is the top bit of the tooth. Um, and this is the bit that would be sticking out of our gums. And then this is part of the skull. So there's actually a little bit more of this tooth that's called the root um, that would be underneath here. And that's the same thing as our teeth um, that we, we have uh, the bit of the tooth that sticks out and then a little bit that's inside too. Um, and somebody just said that they have serrated teeth that are used to crush bones, which is totally true. So Allosaurus um, was a really cool dinosaur, but it probably wasn't able to crush bones. It probably was just able to kill an animal and then eat its meat, whatever it needed to do. Um, but T-Rex had such strong jaws and such big teeth, it was actually able to crush bone, which is absolutely awesome. Um, it's something that not a lot of dinosaurs could do. So that's really cool. Um, and then I have one more piece of T-Rex that you guys might not have ever seen before, which is pretty awesome. And so I'll pick it up. Does anybody have any idea what this might be? Um, this is a fossil. It's from a T-Rex, but it's a part of a T-Rex that you don't usually get to see. So I'm curious if anybody has any ideas what this might be. One person's got it. I'm curious if anybody else can get it. Um, just because it's really weird and it's something that you don't see a lot in museums or other places. Um, let's see. Somebody says an arm. That's a really good guess. Um, so if you looked at, uh, at the tooth, it's about the same size as the tooth and it's actually about the same size as the claw as well, but it's a little bit different. Um, so I can give you guys the answer. Um, let's see. Oh, somebody says tongue. Oh, that's a good guess. Um, but Dylan had the correct answer. This is actually a fossil of a T-Rex brain, which is super weird. Um, so when I say that it's a fossil of a T-Rex brain, um, I'm mincing words a little bit. Um, it's not really a fossil of a T-Rex brain. Basically, the hard stuff of an animal will usually fossilize and the soft stuff will usually dissolve away. That's not always the case, but usually when we find fossils, that's the case. So things like bones and teeth and claws fossilize really well. Soft stuff like brains don't fossilize really well. So how do we get this T-Rex brain? Um, this T-Rex brain was taken by scanning or uh, filling up the inside of a T-Rex skull. So same thing as inside our skull, inside any animal skull, um, our brain fills up the hole inside of our head, right? Um, and so by looking at the hole inside of our head, we're able to figure out what a brain looks like. Um, so scientists were able to look at the hole inside of T-Rex's head where its brain would have been and make what we call a brain cast. Um, so this is a copy of what T-Rex's brain might have looked like. And what's kind of crazy is that it's not that big for a dinosaur that we were able to see is gigantic. It wasn't that large of a brain. Um, that doesn't mean that T-Rex wasn't smart. 
Um, and that's true for all dinosaurs. Just because they had small brains doesn't mean that they weren't smart and that they weren't able to survive in their environments. But it does mean that they were just a different type of animal. So T-Rex, Allosaurus, Stegosaurus, all the dinosaurs were reptiles. And reptile brains are shaped differently than mammal brains like we have. So we might look at this and think, oh, that's a pretty small brain, T-Rex. You must not have been very smart. Um, that's not totally true. It just means that they had a differently shaped reptile brain. Um, and somebody, somebody comments and says the brain only has to be bigger than the prey. So that's exactly right. Just so long as your brain's bigger than the thing you're trying to eat, you're in good shape. Um, that's really funny. I like that a lot. Yeah, so this is a T-Rex brain. Super, super cool. Um, and then I did mention one thing too, that we do have actually one real fossil that actually came from the ground made out of rock in this gallery. Um, so I'm gonna go over and look at that really quick. Set down my T-Rex brain. And so we have one more fossil here that I'm going to look at. And this is our last fossil. This is a, actually I'm curious if you guys know what this is. Um, I can tell you this is from a type of dinosaur that's called a sauropod. Um, I'm curious if you guys know what bone this is. We've got the big brown one in the back and then we have a smaller white one right up here. And let's see, somebody's got the right answer. Um, we've got a couple of people uh, that are answering. Let's see, let's see what they say. We've got a couple of different ones. Yeah, so people are saying thigh bone, femur, leg bone. Um, I'm actually not confident um, that I know whether it is the, the femur or the tibia. It probably is the femur of, of, the, of the, the apatosaurus, but it is definitely a leg bone of a dinosaur. I mean, you can see that this bone is absolutely gigantic. Um, it is a huge bone um, and it comes from a dinosaur that's called a sauropod. If you guys have seen Jurassic Park, Jurassic World, or really any drawing of a dinosaur, a sauropod is one of the dinosaurs that has a long neck, a long tail, and then a body that's in the middle. Um, it's one of those, those long necked dinosaurs. Um, and these dinosaurs were absolutely gigantic. They were some of the largest animals that ever walked the earth. Um, so sauropod dinosaurs are super, super cool. And we have a real bony one right here in the gallery. And we can compare that to a cow bone that's right here next to it, just kind of for size. So you can see how much larger a sauropod would have been than a little cow. Yeah. So that is our tour of Habitat Hall. Um, it is, let's see, 125. We have about five minutes left. So if anybody has any questions um, that they want to ask me, anything that we didn't get a chance to see in the gallery, I know somebody asked if they could see our butterfly wall, which I love and is right around the corner. Um, so I would be happy to show that if people want to see that or if there's anything else you wanna see in the gallery. Um, I did not show the entire gallery either. So if you haven't been to the museum before and you want to come check it out, there's still another half of a room over on the other side that we didn't get a chance to look at. All of the habitats that are north of Michigan. So looking at things like the tundra, um, the Rocky Mountains, which aren't north of Michigan, but are a little bit colder um, and just all sorts of cool stuff. There's lots of great stuff on the other side of the room. Um, but I do have one comment that says that they want to go see the butterfly wall. So I will go show that to you guys. Um, I'm going to put on my mask because right now I'm inside a closed off gallery. Um, but once we go back out into the rest of the museum, I need to wear my mask to make sure that I'm protecting myself and others. So I'm going to put my mask on, um, which actually has bees on it, which is related. It's got, it's got insects. Um, and someone says they'll be back when we open up to the public. That's great. I'm so glad to hear that. I was prepared for the butterfly wall. I'm even wearing my moth shirt today. All right, so I'm going to head out into the hallway and we can check out the butterfly wall real quick. So we'll go around the corner here. The butterfly wall is located just right outside of the habitat hall, right behind me here. This is our butterfly wall. This is a favorite at the museum. People love the butterfly wall. It's super, super cool. Um, this was part of an exhibit that we had a while back that was called Winged Jewels. Um, and Winged Jewels was talking all about butterflies and moths and all sorts of uh, cool insects that were, were really beautiful, but specifically butterflies and moths. Um, we got all sorts of stuff here. Um, so we can see if we go all the way down to the bottom corner here, there's some of these insects, some of these butterflies and moths that are too small to even see very well with our, with our naked eyes. So we need to use a magnifier to see them. There's all these tiny pins down here. And then they go all the way up to the gigantic butterflies over on the side. Um, and so there's some really, really cool butterflies and moths in here. Uh, one of my favorites is the atlas moth here. It's one of the largest moths in the world. Um, atlas moths are super cool. They actually use their wings as defense against the predators. So you can see they've got a little bit of weird coloration on here. And um, when a predator wants to try and eat them, they'll actually close their wings up and it makes them look like a cobra. 
and they're able to kind of shake their wings around and try and uh, get the, the animal to think that they're a cobra instead of a delicious moth, um, which is interesting. But cool, um, we've hit our time for today. So uh, I will say goodbye to everybody now. Um, but thank you so much, everybody who was able to come out. Um, I'm really, really glad we were able to show you around the museum. Um, be sure to check out all of our other programs that we've got coming up this semester. Um, and be sure to come back to the museum when we are open. We are so excited to have you all back when we do reopen back up to the public. Um, it's, it's all we talk about. You guys are the heart and soul of the museum. So we're really excited to have you back when we're able to have you back safely. Um, so thank you so much, everybody. I hope you had a great time. Um, and I will be seeing you all later. All right, have a good rest of your days, everyone.